तीसरे आई के गुजराल जी सर आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू यू फॉर गिविंग मी द ऑपरचुनिटी टू एड्रेस दिस ऑगस्ट हाउस टुडे इफ आई मे से सो इट इज फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम सिंस द इलेक्शन दैट आई एम एड्रेसिंग द हाउस and i am addressing this house at a moment when i feel the situation so demands that with all seriousness and with all application of mind we address ourselves to the issues that are emerging before us it is no use emotionalizing the issue it is no use raising slogans about it mature nations serious nations analyze the situations try to evolve policies to meet them i was originally thinking initially thinking rather of speaking yesterday if i had spoken yesterday i would have addressed myself to the issues arising out of pokhran 2 but today i am speaking in a different background because pakistan also has tested its devices so therefore when i talk today about the issues that are arising i cannot but talk in terms of the major situations that have come before us these are compounded issues and the two tests have to be read together so that we are able to evolve the policy come to some conclusions there are several issues which involve india and pakistan both and for several years we have been talking about them for several years we have discussed them for several years we have been able to meet many of the difficulties that have been confronted and that we have to meet at the moment when i am sitting standing here before you sir i am reminded of a long history but i am not going to take your time to go into that history it is no more possible to really undo that history it is no more possible to discuss at the moment the indo pakistan relations in the context that existed before the two tests were there but before i address myself to the subject as such may i first of all join rest of the house in also offering my homage to the scientists technologists because i think you would purely scientific terms i think the pokhran 2 has proved and if proved was really called any any way called for that our scientists and our technologists are second to none in the world and they are a world class scientists themselves when i talk about the pokhran and i pay my homage and a compliment to the <coughs> nuclear scientists i pay my homage to a science community in totality science cannot be divided in parts even pokhran 2 would not have been possible if other dimensions of the scientific growth had not taken place it was only a few months back that in your state sir we had gone and seen the the spectacle of shri hari kota how indian science made us proud how indian scientists made us proud when we were able to launch a satellite on our own particularly when months back or the year back two years back the american pressure had made russians deny its cryogenic engine here were our people who did it themselves and we went to the space and i am aware that more satellites are about to be launched by us and now we have reached that stage when many countries are approaching us to engage our services for that purpose i also wish to talk about the supercomputer you will kindly recall and the house will recall the supercomputer was denied to us 
And here, where our scientists and technologists, they have made this poor computer themselves. Not only they have made themselves, but also today we are in the market. And many countries which were proud of their scientific achievements are in the queue to buy the supercomputer. Without this supercomputer, nuclear dimension was not possible. And therefore, when I pay my homage, I repeat, I feel that I pay homage to the entire scientific community. They had one challenge before them, and that was that they have turned every denial into, it, into an opportunity. Everything that was denied, they turned into it. It was my modest effort. And a dimension of that homage that some months back, India for the first time offered Bharat Ratan to a living scientist who was there. And when I talk of homage to the Hind community, I have to talk of Nehru, but for his vision, but for his commitment to scientific growth, but for the way he led us and set up the first laboratories in this country, the first, the way he spelt our vision for us, we would not have been where we are. And when I pay homage to him, I am also reminded, not only in terms of science, modern India would not have been modern India but for Nehru's, that visionary leadership and the vision of India that he gave us. In these 50 years that we have traveled, in this house itself, sir, you will recall, and my friend Mr. Sangma was presiding here, when we got together and for nearly a week we discussed the pluses and minuses of our society, what we had achieved, what we had not achieved. At the same time, I think we, would say, we asked ourselves a question that if we had not achieved anything, what would our nation expect us to do at that time and in coming days? In this, therefore, I feel sometimes that the important thing for us was the science must continue to receive our focused attention. Science and technology must receive our attention all the time. Without scientific and technological growth, we will never be able to <laughs> fulfill <coughs> the trieste that Nehru played for us. Science doesn't prosper in hot houses. Science doesn't prosper in the minds which are obscurantists. Science doesn't prosper in those areas where minds are not modern. Science prospers only if your schools, your colleges, your universities provide a wide base for the pyramid, and from there the generation after generation we produce scientists who come to the summit. And when they reach there, they perform as they have done now. But for that, I feel therefore, it is extremely important that we see to it that the base of science education is separate. But that will be the homage. That we see that in our schools and colleges, there is a great deal of work done for education of science. We also hear Mark, and since my friend, the finance minister, is sitting here, that he marks a sizable amount of money for research and development. I said a while ago, science and scientific attitudes do not come unless you have a base for scientific temper. Jawaharlal Nehru often talked about it. May I, in my own humble way, say, sir, when I was assuming office of the Prime Ministership, I had drawn the attention of the nation to this. Scientific temper is a base on which science and technology prospers, and also scientific temper defeats obscure anticipation. And the Vishwas. And unless you defeat and the Vishwas, you cannot think in terms of scientific temper. May I say, some, with some pain, and some anguish. Then is our, when we are trying to glorify science, isn't it a cruel irony that we are thinking of building <coughs> temples, we are thinking of carrying the dust, we are thinking in terms of a, a new situations which encourage obscurantism and not scientific temper. 
It is no use passing resolutions here. It is no use paying compliment here on that side and this side if it does not lead you to scientific encouragement of scientific temper. If you are going to turn scientific achievement into the basic temples, tests, and all these things, then I am very worried about the future of science in this country. And therefore, I hope that when we pass, if we pass a compliment, and if the House decides to pass a resolution, which I would like to share, complimenting, paying homage to our scientific community, at the same time, we will say in the resolution that we want country to encourage scientific temper. And therefore, unless scientific temper is encouraging, and scientific temper, sir, sir, you will know, is also a part of the directive principles of the Constitution. And that is what the Constitution has also said. And that is what we must pay a great deal of attention to you. This. This, having said this, I think it is important for me to come and talk to you here how I look at the present situation. As I said a while ago, I was thinking in a different framework yesterday to talk here. Today I am talking in a different scenario and a different framework. I had some time back written two letters to Prime Minister. The two letters of 13th and 22nd, after the tests were performed. And when I saw the environment building in the country, I thought it was my duty to write to him. And I said several things in those letters. One of the things that I suggested, for God's sake, see to it that government speaks with one voice. The government was speaking with five voices, all divergent all confusing, all giving different messages. And those who listened, they were confused. I don't know those who talked whether they were confused or not. So I urged the Prime Minister twice, please see to it that government speaks with one voice. And please ensure that everything that is said in the name of the government has your prior clearance. So that we know that this is authentic voice of the government. Well, I do not know if attention was paid to that or not. But also I suggested to him that he may also kindly, kindly, I said, ensure that his, that, yes, the letters are here. My colleague tells me letters are here. Well, I will not try to read them. At the same time, I had also suggested in the letter that he must see to it that his colleagues manifest and exhibit some maturity maturity of thought, exhibit the maturity of the office that they occupy, upkeep the dignity of that office, and then talk in turn, out of turn, all the time, creating new type of atmosphere in the country. Sometimes jingoism was talked of, sometimes warmongering was talked of, sometimes challenges were given, sometimes new emotions were roused, as if overnight the country is on the brink of the war. I had also suggested to him that jingoism and warmongering by a nation of the size of the country, India, that is, the maturity of India is once you do create the atmosphere of war, then and without intention of going to war, that is an extremely dangerous thing. For God's sake, take care of it. I also wrote to him and suggested to him that these policies of India have one basic strength, and that is a consensus. And since I had the privilege of being the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister for some time, I have practiced that consensus. I don't have to ask for your credit to me, but I think we showed by practice, whether it was CTBT, our neighbors' relationships, our United Nations, we had explain to everybody how consensus can be and should be built. And I see in the Prime Minister's statement himself and Prime Minister's speech himself saying that he supported all those things himself. For God's sake, I said in my letters, please do it again. Don't try to make it look your party's achievement. It is not your party's achievement. 
and if you want to part with the achievement and you are thinking of going to, to elections, fine. I was very disappointed when a learned friend like Mr. Jagamon, whom I respect a great deal otherwise, tried to turn it into a partisan spirit. You did, my dear. I respect you. You know it. And if you read your speech again, you will come to the same conclusion. And you need not interrupt me. The <laughs> main point that I am trying to say basically is that consensus is the strength of India. Consensus is the strength of a policy. And I had requested the Prime Minister to ensure that whatever policies he was following, he was trying to build a consensus. I also told him when I met him, there is a difference between consensus and giving information. There is a very vital difference in that. You call the leaders of the parties and give them information. That is not consensus building. Consensus building involves flexibility. It involves accommodation. It involves trying to understand other man's point of view. It tries to understand if the other man is saying has some value or not. It either tries to persuade or tries to get persuaded. Only then you can evolve a consensus. Well, I say with a great deal of regret, even now I do not see the process of consensus emerging. Even now, particularly after yesterday. When particularly after yesterday, new challenges are being thought of and everybody is talking in a different tone and different context. I think this was a time when we should have sat together and evolved a consensus. My friend, the leader of opposition, offered it yesterday. Yes. What did he say? He says, if challenge is grave, let us know. Let us understand the challenge. And if we understand the challenge, perhaps we will be able to come to together. No response. No response. No consensus building effort. And if you do not build consensus, how do you build situation? If attitudes are rigid, if attitudes are unaccommodative, if attitudes are non-appreciative, if attitudes are that we know everything, that we have achieved that hour of glory, that we have arrived somewhere where we don't need any money, then I'm sorry, this is not the way to carry the country with you. Having said all this, I do not want to go in that controversy now, whether we should or should not have performed the test. It is behind us. Only thing I would say this thing, that this is the same time, I must say, and I think I speak with full sense of responsibility, having held the high offices. I say with full sense of responsibility that there was no security compulsion for doing the test. And I am saying because I was Prime Minister. I am saying because I knew everything. I am saying because in this country, only Prime Minister is privy of certain secrets, which nobody else is. And I say with that sense of responsibility, there was no, no security compulsion for performing the test. There may have been other considerations. There may have been political considerations. There may have been partisan consideration, but security consideration was definitely not there. When I handed over the country on the 19th of March, there was no security challenge before us. Why was it not there? We, we, it was not there because ever since 1987, when a new situation had arisen before us, in 1987, what was the situation that was arisen? In 1987, by 1987, we came to know very credibly, very definitely, Rajiv Gandhi was a prime minister. We came to know that nuclear weaponry technology had been transferred to Pakistan. We know it for certainty that American was looking aside. It is now on the documents of the Congress of America that America in General Zia's time had tried to look the other way primarily because of Afghanistan situation was there. General Zia was willing to accommodate the American intervention in Afghanistan through Pakistan on two conditions. One, that America will not demand democratization of the country. And secondly, that America will not interfere in the nuclear program of Pakistan. That is why from that day onwards, 93, Pressler Amendment was not enforced. But I must say to the credit of Rajiv Gandhi, 
he was a committed man to the nuclear de denuclearization of the world. He was committed. He believed in it. And I think in that he represented the spirit of India. From Jawaharlal Nehru onwards, Indira Gandhi, every prime minister, if I may say in my own humble way, up to me, we were committed to denuclearization of the world. We feel that every country in the world will be more secure if there is denuclearization. But at that time, Rajiv Gandhi had to perform another duty also. And that duty was duty of Prime Minister. And he performed it well. And without letting any secret out, sir, to which I am sworn, I would only say this thing, that Rajiv Gandhi initiated a process, which process has been well taken care of by all his successors. And that is that Indian security is very safe. That Indian nuclear deterrent is absolutely in the form that it didn't, did not need a test. We wanted to have a deterrent all the time. In this house also, it has been discussed, and I want to say it again. Nuclear weapon is not a weapon of war. <coughs> nuclear weapon has never been used. Nuclear weapon can never be used. And particularly by India. One nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, what happened? One nuclear bomb on Nagasaki, <coughs> what happened? Millions and millions of dies. We, the country with the tradition, we, the country with the civilization, we, the country with a great name to refer to, we cannot possibly have a bomb which kills in one block a thousand people, ten thousand people, or a million people. We cannot do it. Nobody has done it. I have lived in Soviet Union for five years as ambassador of India. I have seen them heaping nuclear weapons. A stage had come by 1979 when Atal Bhairi Bajpayee was a foreign minister. He was visiting Moscow. We were discussing the nuclear policy. We had come to this conclusion, both of us, that Soviet Union had enough arsenal to kill the whole world nine times. The only difficulty was that America could kill by that time 13 times. Do you want to kill the whole world nine times? Do you want to kill the whole world 13 times? And how can you kill a person second time? This was the irony which ultimately destroyed Soviet Union. Once you enter into nuclear war race, don't be under any wrong impression, sir. And all the slogans that have been patriotic zeal we might raise, no country has been able to keep pace. Soviet Union would not have been destroyed that civilization and that ism would not have gone if they had not taken, they had not been joined this race. I was ambassador, I saw it, when 25 to 30 percent of the budget was being spent on the nuclear race. And America was able to destroy them because he pushed them into this race. Your friends have, friends I call, call it quote unquote, both internal and external, have to push you in this race. For God's sake, don't deceive yourself. This is not valor. This is not bravery. It is only self-destruction. And once you go into that race, I do not know how we can, can, can possibly be get out of it. I can see the tragic consequences of the race. The Prime Minister has said, we are a nuclear weapon state. I don't know. I take it at the face value, because weapon has several meaning. If by that he meant that we have a reliable deterrent, I accept. If by that he meant that if word uses in the sense that we have whatever we have is enough to take care of our security, I accept. But for God's sake, draw a distinction between weaponization and militarization. There's a great deal of difference between the two. And I have a newspaper here of two days back when my friend and a great learned man, the defense minister, has said that weapons have already been handed over to the army. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and if that has been done, God help us. I hope if he can. 
I asked the Prime Minister to assure us here that weaponization does not mean militarization. I want the Prime Minister to give me an assurance and give assurance to his house and to the country that we are not joining the nuclear weapon race. Country in despair can do it. Pakistan can be desperate. It is not democracy like the we are. It is not a civilization commitment that we have. It doesn't have commitment to peace that we have. And peace, may I say, sir, is not only slogans, it is a policy. A policy framework has to be built on the peace. Only then you can possibly think in terms of that. I would only like to say also that the, I am not talking in the voice of panic. And nobody can tell me, nor need he tell me, that all those who differ are panicky and all brave men sit on one side. Nobody need tell us that we who have participated in freedom struggle, we are panicky. And those who never participate in freedom struggle, they are brave. <laughs> Nobody need tell us that those of us who have run this country with great deal of zeal, commitment, enthusiasm, responsibility, that we don't understand the country and they do. Nobody need teach us that lesson. Nobody need tell us that basically they understand. Please understand. I beseech you to understand. I beseech you to understand that nuclear race, as I said and I repeat, nuclear weapon race has destroyed countries. Nuclear weapon race has destroyed civilization. And I call it a civilization because in my perception, Soviet Union was a civilization of a new type. You may differ with it. You may agree with it. But it was a civilizational approach. Also, we have seen that superpowers have been destroyed by this race. And we are no superpower as yet. And therefore, let us be not deceiving ourselves. Because one thing we must understand, God forbid, and I say thrice God forbid, if ever a nuclear war comes, there can be no winner, there can be no loser. Nuclear weapons never give victory. And that is why the heaps are being destroyed. That is why now all the SALT treaties and SALT START treaties are being signed. Why are they being signed? They spend billions of dollars on building them. Even not to our satisfaction. We want it to be said destroyed more speedily. All the same, some people are doing it. Therefore, I would only say this thing, that, and I urge the Prime Minister when he addresses us, that he will kindly respond to me. That he will respond to me and tell me and tell you and tell all of us and tell the entire country that under no circumstances will India enter the nuclear weapon race. It is not a question of prestige. It is not a question of glory. It is a question of sense of responsibility. It is a question of commitment to the future of the nation. It is a question of commitment to our children and the future generations that are to come. One thing more, and I would like to add another point now. Sir, you will kindly recall, you were a part of my government yourself. For two years, we made a gigantic effort to give a new twist to our foreign policy. And that new twist was that India's foreign policy must not continue to be Pakistan-centric. That was why it was not a chance that we stopped any polemical war with them. Unilaterally, we stopped responding to any of their provocative statements. I did not even respond to Nawaz Sharif's speech in the United Nations. Why? Not because we could not draft a speech, not because we couldn't use harder words, not because we didn't have the rhetoric at our disposal, primarily because I thought and I believed, and this House believed because they supported me at that time, that basically India has a role to play in the world. And since India has a role to play in the world, its policies must never be Pakistan-centric. And I say this thing, please don't let it happen again. This test and counter-test are making you Pakistan-centric once again. Because all the House discusses 
we are more powerful than Pakistan, we are more courageous than Pakistan. What is Pakistan? Pakistan may or may not be anything. I'm not entering into that controversy. But India definitely must not, in the 50th year of its freedom, remain Pakistan-centric. Second point that I want to say is that, therefore, kindly understand one thing. There is some sort of a latent controversy, call it, rivalry, call it, going on between America and China. Please do not let anybody play China card on you. It is an unfortunate fact that the letter, I do not know who in the Prime Minister's office drafted that letter. Because I know that Ministry of External Affairs did not. And I am very sorry that it did not. Because we are very competent members of the service in the External Affairs Ministry. I do not know how one had to write to Clinton and talk about China. Playing in their hand, playing in a trap. For persistently, I, when I was in charge of foreign policy, I have seen to it that we do not play China card. Or nobody plays China card on us. Or we do not give anyone else a chance to play the China card for us. We have done it. We have annoyed China on one side. We have given a glee to people in Washington. And we do not know which way to look. My dear friend, Mr. Subramanian Swami, is sitting here. He understands China more than I do. I hope he has not forgotten China by now because he's too much interested in the IDMK. But I think when he talks, if he does, he will tell us how dangerous it can be and how dangerous this trap can be. Therefore, when you make your policy formulations, please understand this thing, that do not let others play this card on you. And this will do immense damage to us. With China, we have been carrying on a sort of a slow process but a process which is showing some way out. There's no use talking bravado. In 62, something happened. Today, we are more warriors because we have tested. They have tested 45 times. Does it make you more powerful? Can they use nuclear weapon on you? Can you use a nuclear weapon on them? That issue doesn't arise. And why are you inviting a war again? No wise country invites a war. But here I find some sort of a jingoistic environment has been created, that we are competing with each other, whose language is more irrational, whose rhetoric is more forceful, and therefore we create ourselves in this. Kindly understand one thing more also, and that is the third one, that weaponization is a very serious game of a nuclear weapon. It needs several things. My friend, Mr. Chitambaram, had initiated and spelled out several things of them. He understands finance better than I do. I will not try to tell you how much money it costs in rupees. But I can tell you one thing. And again, I repeat, it is the surest way of derailing yourself from your economic progress. As it is, we are in difficulty. The economic report that came yesterday made all of us think, how shall we get away? And now other things are staring in our face. The impact of these sanctions, the impact of Europe talking another language, the impact of World Bank talking another language, the impact of Japan talking another language. Bravery is a very good word, but josh without hosh is highly dangerous. And that is what I say we must be very clear in what we want to do. And I repeat what I said. Kindly draw, and I hope Prime Minister understands the difference between weaponization and militarization. And I hope if he understands, he will put his foot down. I do not know if the contingency plans have been worked out. If they have been, I do not want them to make them public, but I definitely want them to discuss with us. What is your contingency plan? What are your, what are your plan, plans in diplomacy? Maybe we can help you. What is your contingency plan regarding economy? What is your contingency plan regarding strategy? What is your contingency plan regarding dealing with the neighbors? 
What is your contingency plan for dealing with the major world powers? Therefore, I would say this thing. And since finance minister is sitting here, kindly understand one thing. I am not so much afraid of the sanctions as I am afraid of one thing more. The financial crisis of Southeast Asia, we are seeing. It is not yet over. We are seeing how currencies can be manipulated. We are seeing how fiscal arrangements can be disturbed. I went to Indonesia two years ago, and then I had gone after 10 years. I thought they were doing wonderfully well. I went to Malaysia, and I think you went later than I did. They were doing extremely well. Suddenly, what happens? This switch that these people who control the Brenton Wood organization and institutions, they can make you reel down. God forbid if rupee slides down further. God forbid if we do not take care that in, like Indonesian rupiah, our rupee also slides down. Those are bigger dangers than even the sanctions. And some mayors have to be taken to see that it does not happen. I have also seen many things he said here, which I think which is very important for us to keep in mind. And that is that again I say this thing, that think of the total strategy that you want to deal with. And that strategy papers or contingency papers should be shared again, I repeat, with all of us. But for God's sake, do one thing. And I appeal to you in the name of the country. For God's sake, don't pipe the jingoism. For, don, for God's sake, don't rouse passions in this country. For God's sake, don't create a problem for ourselves that we are inviting a war. We do not want a war. We want peaceful development. We want this country to catch up with those whose rate of growth is 10 to 12 percent. I think my friend, the finance minister, would be much happier to present a budget which can promise 10 to 12 percent rate of growth than to present a budget which is trying to tighten the belt. I hope a day comes. It can come, subject to our wisdom. Also, at the same time, we must see to it. Another danger is there. In our relations with Pakistan, since Simla <coughs> agreement, we had succeeded in bringing Kashmir down to bilateral levels of negotiations. Our progress may have been slow. We may not have been able to succeed as yet. But there is every danger of its internationalization again. I do not know what the diplomatic contingency plan says about it. And what my worthy Prime Minister, who is also former minister, has thought about it. What type of initiatives is he thinking of? I was very surprised and amused and perhaps surprised and also confused when Prime Minister said yesterday his stand has been vindicated. I don't know. I am very confused. Pakistan has tested. And this afternoon, when before I came here, I saw the te television saying, the CNN saying, the foreign minister of Pakistan saying that maybe we'll test one more. One more. One more. He says maybe. Well, great vindication. Then we'll doubly vindicate it tomorrow. If they do it test again, then obviously you'll be more vindicated. <laughs> and if they do it thrice, you'll be thrice vindicated. <laughs> what is vindication about? What are you vindicated for? That you have taken this entire subcontinent into this race. What is this vindication for? That you have undertaken a test purely for political reasons and not for security. And I see it is greatly respected. PM has also said that we are a nuclear weapon state. He must explain it in details. What does he mean by nuclear weapon state? This word means several things to several people. And that is why it is very important Please for silence, us to silence. understand this meaning of this, because then only we can possibly work out a detailed policy response. It is a different matter, and now I would come to see what can be done and what should be done. Please silence. Because I do not think it is only the duty of the Prime Minister to do it. We are also part of the system. We also want this country to survive. 
We also want this country to prosper. And we also want to help in getting out of this rut that you have got us in. I would also suggest at the same time, I think it might be helpful, unless Prime Minister's reason to believe otherwise, unilaterally declare, unilaterally declare non-first use of nuclear weapons. Unilaterally declare that we will never use a nuclear weapon against any power which doesn't have nuclear weapons. You also have said about moratorium, repeat it again. Say it unilaterally. And also declare yourself, is it part of a declared policy that we do not believe in proliferation? And this brings me to CTBT. And I have talked about CTBT at a later part of my address this afternoon, because as this House knows, I had something to do with the CTBT policy. And I presented to this House the policy that I was doing. My approach added one dimension to our CTBT approach. We were talking all the time in the years about denuclearization as an ideology. I added the national security dimension to it. And when I was discussing with Mr. Clinton in September last in New York, I asked President Clinton, to put himself in my shoes. I was Prime Minister at that time, not here. And I asked him, look at India's map around us. I will not spell details here. But I only wish that was the scenario in the letter that Prime Minister wrote. And after listening to me for a while, Clinton said, I understand. That was the approach which I had with President Chirac when he came here and my friend the finance minister of that time was also with me. Same approach I had with the prime minister of Britain. They were all coming around, seeing our point of view. For God's sake, use your diplomatic skills to present your case well. You have a case. Not that you don't have a case, but only it needs doing it well. I would also say that the, to everybody now, and here I say to all of us, and me including myself, let the voice of sanity prevail. Let us talk of peace. This has been our commitment from the day one that we became free. Nehru's priest with destiny. All the time we have a reputation for peace loving nation. For God's sake, preserve it. Preserve this reputation. At the same time, we must also revive, strengthen our commitment to denuclearization. The world must be told that we want denuclearization because then every country is secure. And India will join that. If others denuclearize, so shall we. We have done it in the case of chemical weapons. Nobody knew that we had chemical weapons when I signed the treaty. As a matter of fact, my friend sitting here who are there that side now criticize me. And Shushma particularly did that day. I hope she knocks have a different view now. And I have told them that any treaty which meets our needs, we will sign it, we will observe it. We have observed it. We have also observed the biological weapons treaty. We are also willing to observe this. Therefore, please, one thing more with great deal of difficulty, great deal of effort, great deal of sacrifice, we have built a neighborhood policy. Shushma has just now been to two such countries. She has seen the benefits of those policies themselves. Herself. You have seen how Dhaka responds. You have seen how Sri Lanka responds. For God's sake, don't dismiss it, because somebody, some people, without my consent, have given it my name. You can take the name also. But sustain the policy, please. Sustain the policy of building good neighborliness. And good neighborliness, to first and everything, is it rules out war. Pakistan has offered that willing to, they are willing to talk to us. Talk to them. Pakistan has said they are willing to talk a non-aggression pact. Yes. Pakistan wants anything more. We do not want to cut ourselves to their size. We do not have any ambition 
on Pakistani territory, nor any Pakistan polity. Within the framework of similar agreement, we are willing to talk about Kashmir also. I have said so. I have committed that with the consent of Atal Bihari Bajpai. And please continue that so that the entire issue remains confined to the bilateral framework. If you don't do it, and if Mr. Jagamo is your advisor, God help you. Because then Kashmir will go to the United Nations. Then it will go to New York. It will not stay in this subcontinent. I had said at that time, when we made an agreement with Mr. Nawaz Sharif in Mali, we identified eight items. We said we'll talk on these eight items. And when I met him last in Dhaka in January this year, both of us agreed, I repeat, Nawaz Sharif and I agreed that the future discussions between our foreign secretaries will be on the basis that all the eight issues will be taken up together in one we know, in one place, in one building. We both together gave these instructions to our respective foreign secretaries. This should be sustained. This is hope. I hope, therefore, before I sit down, I hope that my friend sitting on that side, for whom I have great respect, and for some, a great love. Don't mind it, and don't blush. <laughs> I would only say this thing, that contingency plans should be worked out. And I will be repeating that. And contingency plans should have defined objective. And objective is peace. Objective is good neighborliness. Objective is not entering into a nuclear weapon race. Objective is preservation of a situation where the task, my friend, the finance minister is made easier. He can definitely come heavy on us tomorrow. He can definitely do anything like continue to cooperate. But why have that situation if it can be possibly examined? I would only say this thing that I wish all that happened yesterday, though was expected. I wish it had not happened. And I also hope that is not something, it is unfortunate, but not us, let, let us not turn into economic. And I think with this appeal, I take your leave. Thank you.